What's a story, amigos? This is Kino with some cool stories for today's story time. Today, a wily wolf cooks up a tasty plan for his chicken stew. Eat well, my pretty chicken, he cried. Get nice and fat for my stew. Then Tamlin Tomita reads a story about a duck who thinks it's a cat. And a vain emperor who thinks he's wearing more than the bare essentials. He had been. He was wearing nothing. Major Flooding for Storytime is made possible by a grant from Holland and Peter Bing, so that families everywhere can share the joy of reading with their children. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. By the annual financial support from viewers like you. And by the National Endowment for Children's Educational Television. Lucy, my dad and I just cooked up a pot of the most awesome chili in the universe. That's what my dad calls it. The most awesome chili in the universe. <laughs> I brought you some right here. Oh, thank you. Mmm, this is awesome. Oh, and we loved your lasagna too, Lucy. My mom said it was scrumptious. She only uses that word when she means extra, extra good. Oh, well, great. I'm glad you liked it, Kino. I mean, Chef Kino. And now, presenting another taste-tempting recipe from Kino's Kitchen. It's a little something I like to call Chef Kino's Peanut Butter and Jelly Surprise Sandwich. I invented it myself. Chef Kino's Peanut Butter and Jelly Surprise Sandwich. Yep, yep. I brought the ingredients in my backpack. Uh, would you be my assistant, Chef Lucy, and oh. just get that stuff out of there? I'd be delighted, Chef Kino. Okay, everybody, here's what you'll need. Two slices of bread, a jar of peanut butter, some jelly, and I recommend purple, but you can use any color you like, a butter knife, and a banana. Um, Kino, I'm afraid the only thing in your backpack is a jar of peanut butter and a banana. Huh? Oh, no! I think I forgot the jelly! And the bread. And the bread! And the butter knife, too. And the butter knife, too! Oh, no! <sighs> Is that the surprise? No, of course not. The surprise was to put slices of banana inside the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It tastes scrumptious. That's what my mom said. Well, I'm sure it does. But you know, we still have the makings of a pretty good snack here. We do? Mm-hmm. You bet. Okay, we just dip the banana in the peanut butter like so. Mm -hmm. Here's one for you. One for me. Mmm. 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 Hey, this is delicious. We should give it a name. Mm, okay, well, let's see. How about a banana nutter? What? A banana nutter. A banana nutter. Perfect. And that's all for today from Chef Kino's Kitchen. You know, Lucy, I think this banana nutter would go perfectly with a story. <laughs> I think it sure would, Kino. And especially with this story about another chef just like you. It's called The Wolf's Chicken Stew. And it's written by Keiko Kaza. There once lived a wolf who loved to eat more than anything else in the world. As soon as he finished one meal, he began to think of the next. One day, the wolf got a terrible craving for chicken stew. All day long, he walked across the forest in search of a delicious chicken. Finally, he spotted one. Ah, 
She's just perfect for my stew, he thought. The wolf crept closer, but just as he was about to grab his prey, he had another idea. If there was just some way to fatten this bird a little more, he thought, there would be all the more stew for me. So, the wolf ran home to his kitchen, and he began to cook. First, he made a hundred scrumptious pancakes. Then, late at night, he left them on the chicken's porch. Eat well, my pretty chicken, he cried. Get nice and fat for my stew. <laughs> the next night, he brought a hundred scrumptious donuts. Eat well, my pretty chicken, he cried. Get nice and fat for my stew. And on the next night, he brought a scrumptious cake weighing a hundred pounds. Eat well, my pretty chicken, he cried. Get nice and fat for my stew. <laughs> At last, all was ready. This was the night that he'd been waiting for. He put a large stew pot on the fire and set out joyfully to find his dinner. That chicken must be as fat as a balloon by now, he thought. Let's see. But as he peeked into the chicken's house, the door opened suddenly, and the chicken screeched. Oh! So it was you, Mr. Wolf! Children! Children! Look! The pancakes and the donuts and that scrumptious cake! They weren't from Santa Claus! All those presents were from Uncle Wolf! <laughs> the baby chicks jumped all over the wolf and gave him a hundred kisses. <laughs> oh, thank you, Uncle Wolf. You're the best cook in the world. Uncle Wolf didn't have chicken stew that night, but Mrs. Chicken fixed him a nice dinner anyway. Oh, shucks, he thought as he walked home. Maybe tomorrow I'll bake the little critters a hundred scrumptious cookies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, you know, I had a feeling that that story was going to have a happy ending. <laughs> Me too. I think the wolf's conscience began to bother him when he saw all those cute little chicks and heard how much they liked his pancakes and donuts. His conscience? Is that like his stomach? <laughs> no. No, your conscience is that part that tells you what's right and what's wrong. And I think the wolf's conscience told him it would be wrong to put his little chickens, his new friends, into his stew. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure there are plenty of other things he knows how to make for his dinner. He's a good cook. Just like you, right, Chef Kino? Mm, well, I don't know. I, I forgot half the ingredients for my peanut butter and jelly surprise sandwich. Maybe I'm not cut out to be a chef after all. Oh, don't be discouraged, Kino. Oh, you'd make a great chef. It just takes practice. Well, it's hard to decide what to be. Sometimes I want to be a chef, and sometimes I want to be a starship commander. <laughs> and sometimes I want to be a soccer player. Well, you have plenty of time to decide what you want to be. I didn't decide I wanted to be an artist until I was a lot older than you are now. You, you didn't? Mm -mm, that's right, I didn't. Oh, so don't, don't hurry. Just take your time and decide what you want to be. Mm, I guess you're right. Would you like to hear a story about a duck who couldn't decide what he wanted to be? My friend Tamlin's going to read it to us and as soon... Oh, here she is now. Oh, great. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Hi, Kino. Hi. Hey, have you been doing some cooking? Oh, well, sort of. <laughs> well, I'd like to introduce you to two friends of mine. This is Erica, and this is Jeffrey. Hi. Oh, hi, Jeffrey. Hi, Erica. <laughs> Would you all like to hear a story? Oh, yep, yep. Yes. OK, here it goes. This one is called Duck Cat, and it was written by Galen Gordon and illustrated by Chris Gaskin. On Monday morning, Mabel opened her door. There was a duck 
on the back step. Hello, said Mabel. Meow, said the duck. Odd, said Mabel. Very odd. She put it in the lily pond, but it hated that. It yelled. I've never been scratched by a duck before, said Mabel. The duck would not eat bread, but it drank a bowl full of milk. It caught five mice and gave them to Mabel. Odd, said Mabel. Very odd. When the duck wasn't looking, Mabel hid the mice in the bread bin. I don't want to hurt its feelings, she said. The duck hid under the sofa and pounced at Mabel's toes. Well, said Mabel, you are a very different sort of duck. When Mabel started knitting, the duck joined in. It growled at the balls of yarn and stalked them like a mighty hunter. It rolled them all over the floor. Odd, said Mabel. Very odd. The duck curled up by the fire and purred a bit. Mm -hmm. Then it went to sleep. That duck, said Mabel, thinks it's a cat. She got out her doctor book and looked up what to do for a duck that thinks it's a cat. When the duck woke up, there were pictures all around it. There were pictures of ducks labeled duck and pictures of cats labeled cat. The duck changed the labels over. Well, said Mabel, what do I have to do to show that you're a duck? The duck shrugged. It said. Mabel took the duck outside. Cats climb trees, said Mabel. The duck climbed the tree. Odd, said Mabel. Very odd. You know what? It's more like cats. <laughs> <laughs> and cats wash behind their ears, said Mabel. And the duck wash behind its ears. <laughs> odd, said Mabel. Very odd. Butch, the dog who lived next door, bounced through the gate. Dogs chase cats, said Mabel. But they chase ducks, too. Butch nearly got the duck, but it flew up to the top of the lamppost. You couldn't do that if you were a cat, said Mabel. Mabel pushed Butch through the gate and locked it. You can come down now, Mabel told the duck. said the duck. Cats can't fly down from lampposts, said Mabel. And I don't have a ladder. If you are a cat, you'll just have to stay up there. The duck flew down. It looked up at Mabel. Quack! It said. You were only joking, weren't you, said Mabel. Quack! Said the duck and it went for a swim in the lily pond to cool off. On Tuesday morning, Mabel opened her door. There was a cat on the back step. Hello, said Mabel. Quack, said the cat. Odd, said the duck. Very odd. <laughs> what a great story. And as I always say, if something looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. <laughs> probably. Probably. Kino, you look like a chef today. Are you really a chef? Oh, well, these are just chef's clothes. I may look like a chef, but I'm not really sure I am one. You know, that reminds me of a, a wonderful old story about an emperor who thought his clothes were very, very important. Oh, well, what's an emperor? An emperor is like a king. Oh. 
I think I know the book you mean. Is it The Emperor's New Clothes? Yes, that's it. Would you like to hear it? Oh, yes, yes. Story, story, <laughs> story. <laughs> OK, here it goes. The Emperor's New Clothes, as retold and illustrated by S.T. Mendelssohn. Once upon a time, there was an emperor who was much loved, mostly by himself. After all, he was not just any emperor. He was the best-dressed emperor the world had ever known. And even he himself was impressed by that. Everyone told the emperor how magnificent he was, how rich he was, and how magnificently richly dressed he was. The emperor quite agreed with them. He never for a moment suspected that everyone secretly thought he was quite silly and that his clothes showed it. The truth of the matter is, there really is no easy way to tell an emperor he has bad taste. The emperor was, however, generous by nature, though mostly with himself, and used any excuse to create a holiday for his subjects. The highlight of every holiday was the grand processional, during which all the emperor's subjects would loudly cheer the emperor and praise his latest imperial outfit as he rode through the streets. Being as wise a ruler as he was beloved, the emperor had many spies in his empire, mostly in the garment district. He kept tabs on all the latest clothing trends and time and again astounded everyone with the newest fashion before it even was a fashion. It was from the reports from his many spies that the emperor came to learn of an incredible magical tailor. Everyone agreed that the tailor was incredible and magical, though no one could exactly say why. You see, no one had actually ever seen anything by way of a length of fabric or a stitch of thread from this tailor. Still, he had enough of a reputation to intrigue the emperor, who promptly sent for him. Well, my good fellow, the emperor said, tell me, what is so extraordinary about the clothing you make? Majesty, your highness, emperor, sir, replied the tailor. The clothes I make are rich and rare and can only be seen by those of highest distinction. Through magic cunning, they are invisible to those who are unfit for their positions or who are unforgivably silly, <laughs> or both. The emperor hired him on the spot. Make me an outfit of such clothing immediately, demanded the emperor. He thought to himself how splendid it would be to know which of his subjects were unfit or unforgivably silly. Only the best fabrics, threads, and especially jewels would do for such an incredible, magical tailor, creating such a wondrous ensemble for an emperor with such exquisite taste. The emperor ordered the palace thrown open to the tailor, including the treasury, which was quickly emptied by the tailor's many orders for gold and precious stones. Daily, the emperor received reports on the progress of the robes from the tailor, who in all modesty proclaimed them to be the most beautiful in the universe. But these reports were not enough for the emperor. The emperor had just enough dignity not to run through the halls of the palace himself for a peek at the tailor's work. Instead, he sent his prime minister 
The Prime Minister was shocked. He saw nothing. Was he unfit to be Prime Minister? Surely he was just a little silly, but not unforgivably silly. This was simply too much. Not having an emperor's dignity, he ran all the way back to the emperor and made up a glowing account of the wondrous fabrics he had just been to see. Thrilled with what he heard, but wanting to hear more, the emperor sent his lord admiral and captain of the guard to inspect the most beautiful clothing in the universe. The Lord Admiral and the Captain of the Guard were shocked. Neither of them saw anything but the tailor busy at an empty loom. Could they be unfit for their positions? Surely they were no more silly than the average Lord Admiral and Captain of the Guard. This was simply too much. They ran all the way back to the Emperor and delivered a report just as glowing as the Prime Minister's. An armada of cloth, said the Lord Admiral. A phalanx of fashion, said the Captain of the Guard. Even an emperor's dignity has limits. Unable to contain himself any longer, the emperor ran all the way through the palace to the tailor's rooms and burst in. The emperor was shocked. He saw nothing. It was preposterous to think he might be unfit or unforgivably silly. After all, he was the emperor. This was really too much. The universe is surely too small a place for something as remarkably beautiful as this as this masterpiece, declared the emperor. The tailor graciously accepted the imperial comment with a bow. The emperor's cabinet met to discuss how best to celebrate the emperor's new clothes. After much bickering, debating, complimenting the emperor on his brilliance and other all-around silliness, it was decided that nothing less than a day of national salvation would do. Proclamations were sent throughout the empire. Newspapers prepared to cover the grand event. The palace was repainted and the streets were cleaned. Tension mounted as the great day approached. The emperor, the prime minister, the lord admiral, and the captain of the guard were worried. What if it was discovered that they couldn't see the new clothes? Everyone would think them unfit for their positions or unforgivably silly. What then? At last, the great day came. The tailor took special care dressing the emperor describing each article of clothing in great and glorious detail as he helped the emperor into it. Fortunately, the tailor had the exclusive honor of assisting the emperor, for no one else would have been able to tell which garment was to go where and would surely hand the emperor his vest instead of his pants or his shirt instead of his stockings. The emperor preened himself to perfection. Trumpets blared and drums rolled as the emperor in his full majesty left the gates of the palace. But from all the people gathered to cheer the emperor's new clothes, there arose only a shocked silence. Saw nothing. In that horrible moment, before the crowds could collect their wits and loudly praise the emperor's magnificent but invisible robes, a child <laughs> yelled out, But Mama, the emperor is wearing a girdle. 
all was lost. There was no doubt in the Emperor's mind now. He had been, he was, wearing nothing. With the dignity only an Emperor can muster, he held his head high, adjusted his girdle, turned around, and marched magnificently back into the palace. And all agreed that this retreat was the Emperor's finest hour. The end. Don't you mean rear end? <laughs> rear what? end. <laughs> and that's a funny rear end, too, huh, Kino? Yeah. <laughs> I think this story has a lot of lessons to be learned. Like, don't be afraid to tell the truth. That's right. I wish just putting on a chef's hat and, and an apron like this made me a great chef. Being a great chef takes lots of work. That's right. I think you could probably be one, though, Kino. Your recipe for a peanut butter and jelly surprise sandwich sounded yummy. Oh, well, thanks. Oh, oh, and, and speaking of recipes, here's my recipe for some more story reading fun. A book about another wolf who gets in trouble in the kitchen. Only this one has a great recipe for boy soup. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> it's called Beware of Boys, and it's really funny. And I'd like to recommend the story of a young boy who lives in Cairo, Egypt. It's called The Day of Ahmed's Secret, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Well, that's our story time for today. Thank you, Tamlin, for coming to visit us. Well, thank you so very much for inviting me. And goodbye, everybody. And remember, keep, keep a, a story, story in your heart. heart. <laughs> and bon appetit, my little banana nutters. <laughs> <laughs> Today's storytime books are The Wolf's Chicken Stew by Keiko Kaza, The Emperor's New Clothes, retold and illustrated by S.T. Mendelssohn, Duck Act by Galen Gordon, illustrated by Chris Gaskin, Beware of Boys by Tony Blundell, and The Day of Ahmed's Secret by Florence Perry Hyde and Judith Hyde Gilliland, illustrated by Ted Lewin. You can find these and other books at your local library. Major funding for Storytime is made possible by a grant from Helen and Peter Bing so that families everywhere can share the joy of reading with their children. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. By the annual financial support from viewers like you and by the National Endowment for Children's Educational Television. Storytime is a production of KCET Los Angeles.